And I really do think that people getting involved at a local level, whether it's helping out at the church soup kitchen or running for zoning board, I think all those are really important things and those are things that if any of us in this room is so inclined, we could do. And so as a citizen, I'd say the fellow citizens, do something that makes you feel good and makes you feel better. Thank you, Heidi, and thank you everyone for being here. It's a real honor to be uh, on this panel and, and, um, and part of this conversation. I, uh, I was asked, it was actually uh, over the holidays, I was asked by a uh, writer and editor named Carolina de Robertis to contribute to an anthology uh, entitled Radical Hope which will come out later this spring from Knopf, which um, is, is letters by writers um, to anyone we wanted to write to, to try to offer some hope. <laughs> so this is, um, this, this is a somewhat condensed version. It's still on the long side, but I'll, I'll, tr I'll, I'll try to, well, I'll try not to read it too fast, but anyway. Dear Olivia, when you were seven weeks old, we took you to a wedding in New York City. With the exception of the lovely bride, you were the bell of the ball, handed from aspiring grandmother to aspiring grandmother, chin chucked, dandled, cooed over, cuddled. Daddy surreptitiously changed your diaper in the library of the fancy private club. A television star praised your dimples. You loved every minute and didn't cry once. Two days later, Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked passenger jets and flew them into a field in rural Pennsylvania, the Pentagon, and the Twin Towers killing thousands. The world into which we thought you had been born was ineradicably altered in a matter of hours. So began the terrible time of fear, the better part of a decade in which our actions and reactions as a nation were premised on constant dread and anxiety. In 2008, Barack Obama ran for president with the slogan, Yes, We Can, on a platform of hope. You turned seven that year, the age of reason. We believed that we could, as a nation, surmount our fear together. We believed in choosing peaceful dialogue instead of conflict, in openness and tolerance instead of division and hatred. We believed in a progressive future instead of a return to the past. Now, my daughter, you're approaching 16, and here we go again, back into a permanent defensive crouch, a return to the time of fear we knew when you were a little girl. It's not that we can't get through this, of course we can, but I'm sorry that you're launched so young into the fight. Remember that this man is not the cause of our society's problems, he is merely the symptom. If we battle those ills, we can defeat him. He is the face of many of our failings, his rise the confluence of diverse problems to which we have failed as a nation to attend. With the disappearance of any counterbalancing Marxist or socialist discourse, Americans have become utterly enslaved to mammon. Bernie Sanders and his followers represent the national outrage at this situation. Like some parody from central casting, the demagogue in chief believes his wealth alone entitles him to the highest office in the land, and apparently many voters too lost sight of the fact that statesmanship is not the same as business acumen. Americans obsessed with personal gain no longer see the common good as the highest good. Indeed, the unnameable in debate could argue that his failure to pay taxes, an abdication of which millionaires of yore would rightly have been ashamed, was simply a matter of his intelligent use of a legal loophole. In other words, his scrupulous attention to his private wealth was a ma matter for public admiration rather than condemnation, and he was elected for it. Then, too, there is our society's disingenuous myth-making, the lies we tell ourselves to dull rebellion. The American dream, as ta Coates has recently observed, remains for many, particularly minorities, a false promise. You remember the obese, unwell, and aging taxi driver who took us to the airport before dawn, obsessively ranting against Obamacare because when he makes his millions, he doesn't want to have to pay for anyone else's medical bills. He's one of many deluded by a fantasy, a fantasy that Donald Trump has rekindled and encouraged, the idea that each of us is a millionaire in waiting who should behave with all the superiority and scorn of a millionaire in the firm belief that the individual matters more than society and in the firm belief that money matters more than background, which it may, or than education, which it may not, or than morals, which it cannot, and that money will soon be ours. Remember our amazing evening at King Lear. Can you see in your memory 
Lear mad upon the heath, besmirched in his tattered loincloth, his crown of weeds, his kingdom and his power lost. We joked afterwards that the new president should be made to sit through it, and you laughingly said, he wouldn't, he couldn't. Because the play's lessons, its wise truths were too uncomfortable for such a man to endure. Handy dandy, which is the justice, which is the thief? A dog's obeyed in office. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plate sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Only when he wanders naked and abandoned in the storm does Lear realize at last that all men are the same, that the greatest and the least among us are kin, that they're but for the grace of God, and so forth. It's a lesson all of us must learn sooner or later. For many, it isn't until we're near death. I truly understood it first when Grandpa was in the rehab hospital, not in his right mind, around the time he waved a twirling finger in the air, not unlike Lear, in fact, and said, I know what this is, it's a fiesta. And a nurse's aide came in, her shoes squeaking on the lino, clipboard in hand, and asked in efficient tones without looking at the man in the bed, what was he before? Suddenly I grasped truly that my father, whom I so loved and had so feared, had held in awe, was too no more than a poor, bare, forked animal, unaccommodated man, the same as anyone else. I would learn it again and again in the course of my parents' illnesses, their respective journeys to the grave. All that we believe defines us counts for nothing. Ultimately, each of us is not just Lear in his lucid madness, we're poor Tom himself. To live in hope without fear, with nothing to lose, that's freedom, and that's what democracy should allow. Any society that believes that money is the greatest power can't truly be free. This callow soul our nation has recently elected to its highest office is far from attaining this fundamental knowledge, as one must presume are too many of our fellow citizens. But that's not a reason to pretend we don't know the truth. And knowing it, we must choose to live differently in the understanding that the refugee, the outcast, the other, the criminal, their poor Tom also, we are all the same naked on the blasted heath. As James Lowell wrote in the Boston Courier in 1845, in what would become one of the oft-sung hymns of my childhood, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. The poem's last verse reads or sings thus, though the cause of evil prosper, yet the truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. I'm not religious in any traditional sense, and nor are you, or not just now, but the moral imperative remains as clear for us as it does for any devout believer. We know in our bones that there is right and there is wrong, and we know that in difficult times, as much as in the easy ones, we must defend what we believe to be right. As poor Tom knew, as Lear came to know, we are all bare human beings beneath our clothes, humble in our lives and deaths. Power and prominence are as meaningless as wealth and beauty. All is vanity. This hollow president, vanity incarnate, is the voice of a hollow culture. Hollow men and women are abroad in the land. So Livia, my dearest daughter, it is up to us, and in the future it will be up to you to defend substance, to forge a true path and a meaningful one, to be fearless, joyful, hopeful. Privileged as we are, we have an obligation to be happy, to work for justice, openness, and generosity wherever possible, to listen fully to complexities and try our best to understand, to hold the lamp illumined and aloft. No good gesture is wasted, no kindness is otiose, no sacrifice is too great. Each of us must shed light where we can. Thank you for setting the stage. It's a beautiful letter, and um, I think we all wish we could write to our children like you write. <laughs> Tonight is about how we come together as a society and include all who wish to be part 
of the Great American Project. I come, you may not know, from a small town in Canada. I, too, am an immigrant. Sometimes Canadians can be a bit irreverent about it, but the truth is there are ten times as many people here in the land of possibility, and even up north in the land of the true and the strong and the free, there's long been something very appealing about that in America. Tonight it's really important to me that we dismantle the belief that places of education, like Cambridge, and there are many in this nation, are open to only those who go to the great institutions, like Harvard and MIT. That is precisely why I started the editorial.com four years ago. I began putting one interview up after another with young children at home because I had this amazing access of great minds around me. I wrote them in a way that I thought others around the world could access them. And I wanted you, anywhere, with any background, as long as you can read, to be part of it. And all of these people I interviewed here today were open to it because they want to share what they know and they too believe in a free and educated society. My parents always encouraged us as children to have knowledge. I remember my dad saying, knowledge is something that people can never take from you. They can take a lot of things, but they cannot take your education. And that does not have to be an education in a fancy institute. It can be, but it can also just be by reading and learning and listening. I've always carried that with me, and so I'd like it to be our goal tonight as a group, and to all of you when we ask you quest to open up to your questions, I'd like you to think about how we can give people knowledge. It is a privilege that we have here in this corridor of Cambridge. I think that all people, and I believe all people in this nation, can think critically. They have to be given the knowledge and the tools and be part of this great project that we're part of. I think that the American Public Library is an incredible place to start this movement of knowledge. They're free, they're across the country, and people all around this country can gather in their public libraries and share discourse with the other people in their communities that they believe have taken time to gain knowledge. WGBH Forum is broadcasting this live on Facebook, which is very exciting, because I worry about us being in an echo chamber. And so, not just to promote what we're doing at the library and on the editorial, but as part of this movement to share knowledge in our country, Share it on whatever your stream is. Is it Snapchat? Is it Facebook? Is it picking up something novel like the telephone or having coffee with a friend from far away? But let's start sharing the knowledge across this country because I believe that all people can think critically. I'm grateful tonight to have these huge minds who have spent their careers digging deep into their fields to share knowledge around immigration, journalism, civil rights, and technology and the arts. One thing that has struck me as I've done these interviews with the editorial is that the people that we sit with have spent years thinking about their craft. And that knowledge, they are so excited to share. When I sit down and say, I'm going to sit with you for 45 minutes and hear this interview um, and ask you a lot of questions, they just shine. I mean, who doesn't like being paid attention to? <laughs> so I want us to make that our goal tonight, um, that we try and get as much knowledge as we can out of these four guests up here. And I know there are a lot of smart people in this audience and I hope you will share with us as well. Um, but let's make this a community event tonight to try and put some facts on the table to get what knowledge we need and then go and share it. Um, we, have not, uh, have Ron, we do not have Ron Sullivan with, uh, with us. I'm hoping he will show up soon. But in lieu of that, I'm going to, um, I was going to begin with Ron because in our latest interview, which is our 100th, Ron talks about how he thinks one of the big changes we can make in civil rights and mass incarceration is to start think of, thinking of ourselves as a country as we, um, and that just the pronoun we can shift a lot. So if he doesn't join us tonight, I hope that you will go read his interview because I thought it was important. So I'm going to start with you, Susan, because the immigration ban is a place where we can apply the pronoun we and I'm hoping that you can um, begin by telling us where things stand and um, why people should not be afraid. What are you telling people who are afraid? Um, and you all need to turn your mics on when you grab them. So what, where's the latest with the ban? 
and why we should not be afraid. Can you hear me? So good news, I get to be the bearer of good news again, um, and that is that the courts of Hawaii and a court in Maryland both looked at the second Muslim ban um, after a number of courts looked at the first and found that the second ban, which was substantially more well-crafted, more well-written, they took out some offensive language about um, preferring the Christian religion over the non-Christian religion uh, refugees, that, that was all taken out they, they couldn't help themselves. They put some language in about honor killings. We don't know why that's in there. They just like they just couldn't control themselves. But when the ban was recrafted, it was recrafted in a much, I will concede, a slightly more intelligent way and a slightly, I did have a little heart palpitation when I read it going, uh-oh, this is going to be a little harder to do. The first ban was kind of like shooting ducks in a barrel, like, are you kidding me when you read it? And that's why we went to the airport. My office went to the airport that night to try to sue because we knew it wasn't going to be a hard sell to many judges. So thankfully, though, um, a ban is a Muslim ban is a Muslim ban is a Muslim ban. The intent of the candidate Trump, the uh, statements of the surrogates of uh, President Trump, and the uh, real base offensiveness of the first Muslim ban have been imputed into this second ban. Um, and two courts have overturned it. The Fourth Circuit has an accepted an appeal of the Maryland decision. So what happens is, I don't know, I, I talk about this like it's so easy, but all these cases that were first filed were filed in district, federal district courts, so there's about 50 of them. Only li really like six or seven had any leg room. Many of them were voluntarily dismissed after their plaintiffs were released. Uh, Boston had a very good order that came out. It was either second or third in the nation. I'm trying, I keep meaning to check to see for second. Um, New York had the first. And then the government or the loser can appeal to a circuit court, and there's a number of circuit courts that have had uh, their hands in this. Ninth Circuit and Fourth Circuit are the two ones that seem to be, or th that will, something will happen with. So the fourth the government appealed in, they're leaving the Ninth Circuit out of this because the Ninth Circuit as you've probably seen President Trump tweet, is not friendly to the president. It's definitely one of our more progressive uh, circuit courts. I say more legally correct circuit courts. And the ninth, cir <laughs> the ninth Circuit is Hawaii. Right, the Ninth Circuit the is fourth Hawaii circuit and is Washington Maryland. State, and Fourth Circuit would be Maryland. So right now we're awaiting some sort of word um, from the Fourth Circuit in Maryland, which means that it's setting up. So when circuit courts have differing opinions from each other, we lawyers call that a split in the circuits, and it's one of the criteria the Supreme Court will look at to decide whether they'll take a case on. So, you know, if Maryland, if the uh, Fourth Circuit comes out and says, well, of course it's a Muslim ban, it's unconstitutional, then, you know, maybe it won't go up to the Supreme Court, who knows? Um, that's, so that's our current situation. And then what about fear? Because you have a lot of people who would love to have access to you right now who are really fearful for their family and that they're going to be deported and they're going to have to leave the country. What are you saying to those people? So there, the fear out there is something, I've been practicing immigration law since um, 1998, 97, and um, the Obama administration was not a saint to immigrants, despite what this current administration would like to tell you. There was a lot of arrest, there was a lot of detention, but what we had with the Obama administration that we don't have now is, is some system to it. There was some rules, and the rules were, I was a lawyer, I could look up the rules, and I could say to my client, if you go to check in at ICE, you will not be detained. And there was some rhyme or reason to it. We don't know what the rules are anymore. They've all been thrown out. And so that's been creating such fear that I have friends telling me that they treat immigrants uh, as doctors with infectious diseases, the immigrants have the infectious disease, and, and they won't show up to their appointments. I have, I can't tell you, we do, we've done about 200 Know Your Rights presentations, like around uh, the New England area, and I can't tell you how many times a teacher stands up and says, is my child going to get pulled out of the classroom? Or are they gonna get arrested in the classroom? That is creating enormous fear. There are fake ICE agents who are pretending to be ICE agents going on the subway system and asking people for ID and then asking for money so that they don't, de they don't arrest them that moment. Um, th it's, it's intense, and it's all created by this administration on purpose, and the purpose is to get people to self-deport. What I've been telling people, I, that sounded really dire and terrible, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. What I've been telling people is this has to come down, calm down. This is not sustainable. 
unless they really do hire 15,000 new border agents and ICE agents, there's not enough bed space to lock all the people up they say they're gonna lock up. There's not enough ICE agents to find these people. Um, they are making a very big show of their intent to arrest people and deport <coughs> people so that people will leave, so that people will be afraid. And my statement is, stay low, don't be afraid, because this, is, this can't be done the way that they say they want it done. They're trying to get TV cameras and everything to show that they're really tough on immigration, but it's, uh, my hope is that it, it, it will calm down eventually. Miguel, can we talk to you about technology and what you're seeing inside tech companies? Because um, there has been a lot of uh, news out on how the tech companies were very active in the last ban, um, and now because the H-1Bs don't seem to be having as much trouble, um, you know that's changed. Now you have uh, you have a, a huge group of people that have come into these technology companies in our country, and you yourself are an immigrant as mm -hmm. well as. I am. And so um, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience as someone who's come into the U.S. and what you advise people and also what you're seeing from technology companies? Well, if I <laughs> two, the advice, two questions. I, I'll delegate the advice to Susan, uh, which is, a, <laughs> I think, is a state or national hero uh, after yeah, she what she did. In, uh, it's amazing. We all watched the video. <laughs> I remember when I told Peter that Susan was going to be on the panel, he goes, wow, you got the it girl. <laughs> well, I remember the night that this was happening, we're thinking, well, we should go to the airport. Uh, but the kids were sleeping, and then happy you were there. <laughs> oh, my mic is on? Oh, okay. I was just too far okay. away. Okay. Uh, you know, we wanted to go to the airport, but I'm, I'm happy that Susan was there. <laughs> and I heard the story the next morning about the about how you got the case. I think that's a great story, and I think you should tell it, but. Um, Do you want to tell the story? Yeah. Why don't you tell the story first? It's a great, it's a great story. I have a feeling this is going to be one of the stories that my grandkids will be like, oh, not again. You know? <laughs> but you know, I, it really is why I became a lawyer. It was my dream to be involved in like a national litigation like this. I'm sorry about the circumstances, but it really is a gift to me, and I feel incredible. I get so embarrassed when people say, oh, you know, do anything like that because it's a gift to be in this position to be able to do something but everybody else is pulling every hair out of their head because of Donald Trump and at least I could go and do something but my associate who's in the office uh, Heather Yance and I were talking and I happen to be the chair of the American Immigration Lawyers of New England this year good timing right and we're like oh my god I'm getting I mean my emails blowing up my phones blowing up everybody's calling me going what are you gonna do and I'm like okay okay I got this no problem and um, so we talked, a bunch of people talked, and somebody suggested that we go to the airport and put up uh, lawyers' phone numbers, like trusted lawyers within our legal community, to take phone calls, and maybe we might just get a plaintiff. And I'm, I'd been in touch with the ACLU about this, and I have, um, I'm good friends with Susan Finnegan, who's from one of the big law firms, and they're really wonderful about supporting uh, progressive legal causes like this. So we went to the airport, and we walked around, and we kind of were, um, Heather, I, I, don't, I don't know if any of you read the Globe article, but Heather, my associate, came in her jeans and a sweatshirt because she, of course, had just been at a rally. And I was like, you want to go to the airport? She's like, sure. And she's got like two kids, on, you know, a kid on each arm. Her husband has to come and pick up her kids. My husband has to come home and like take over our kids because I had planned to do all the afternoon activities. And she's like, well, I can't go to the airport dressed like this, right? Because we knew the media would be there. I was like, oh, you can wear my clothes. She wears size six shoes, and I wear size eight shoes, so she had to like wear my size eight shoes all afternoon into the evening. We get to the airport, and we get kind of depressed around 6 p.m. because the media is there, everybody's watching, but we have no plaintiffs. And you cannot sue unless you have someone who's aggrieved by the problem, right? No plaintiffs, no case. So we were like sad, long faces, and okay, I guess we should just go home and be with our families. And all of a sudden, um, Heather said that these two people had been sitting there for a long time, and I heard one of them say, case by case basis, which is the language of the executive order. By the way, this place is filled with people now. There's a thousand protesters, which I cannot tell you, when you ask about fear and reducing fear, those people did so much. Like people who went to the airport that night, just I, I am brought to tears sometimes thinking about it because our clients would walk out of lockup and they had been just interrogated six, sometimes for six hours and there's this crowd of people with welcome, we love you, and flowers, and 
it was really, really, really an incredible moment when, when people would finally come out. Um, and at that time, we thought everybody was going to get sent back, even lawful permanent residents, because the, the law was on the, it was so poorly written, we had no idea what they were, who they were excluding. It seemed like they were excluding everyone. Anyways, so we approached this couple, and then they pointed us to another couple, which happened to become our two plaintiffs. They agreed to sue. And then, but it's Saturday night at like, you know, it's 9 o'clock. Well, if it's time, it's like 7, 8 o'clock at night. We're like, how, weren't they inside? They were texting their relative. Oh, so they were inside yeah, texting so the relative. When okay, you go ahead. through secondary, you can use your cell phone to you actually get brought in. And so we got permission from the relative inside. Yes, if I get detained, I'll agree. And they were brought into secondary, and it didn't look like they were coming out anytime soon because it was really long. I mean, it turned out that they all ended up getting let out that night, but it was taking a very long time for people. So um, we, somebody, you know, my husband knows a federal judge who's retired, and we kind of called everybody we knew, and we finally got a, a phone number, a cell phone number, of a federal magistrate judge. Like, it's like, I'm, I got the text, like, Judge Dean's number is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I just could not believe it. And I'm like, Okay, I'm gonna just call the federal judge on her cell phone, no problem. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there I go, you know. And I'm like, we the people. What? <laughs> we the people. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, here we go. And I like dialed the phone number. I was like, my, I think my whole body was physically shaking at this point in time. I had to go into the bathroom because it was the only quiet place. I was like, hi, judge, you know, um, just here at the airport and then I got this person detained and I'd like a hearing. She's like, all right, I'll call you. Like, she was at the Schubert Theater, like in the middle of a play, <laughs> like, come out of the play. So she calls back and she says like, oh, I can't remember the exact words, honestly, but she basically said something like, we'll see you Monday morning. The effect of which we'll see you Monday morning. Like, no, no, I, I don't think it's gonna work, you know? And I didn't say it like this, but in my mind, I'm like, no way, I wanna hear it now, you know? <laughs> and um, so I said, I really think we need to hear. We've got all these like international planes coming in and I think there's gonna be more people. This is just the beginning. And she goes, like there's this long pause and she goes, Okay, I'll see you at the courthouse at 9.30. Now, have you guys seen the federal courthouse, right? It's enormous, and it's Saturday night, and it's not, I don't think it's an easy thing to just unlock the door and go in, right? And I'm like, because <laughs> um, I thought this was all gonna be on the phone. And she goes, and I said, uh, the, uh, the, is it gonna be open? <laughs> and she's like, yep. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, we run out, and like, I don't wanna make this too long, but like, you know, as we're leaving, Maria Sacchetti starts chasing us because she d wants to know where we're going. I'm like, go away, Maria! And my associate and I would get into the car, and we would go over there, and on the way, we'd heard that New York had issued an order that had been kind of interpreted as a national order. It's still questionable whether it was. And we had a hearing, and we get there, and the clerk says, well, where's your pleadings? And we're like, we have them in paper, right? My friend had come, Carrie Doyle, and brought them in paper, and she goes, and Matt Siegel from the ACLU had been doing all the behind the scenes drafting with all the information. And I said, uh, it's right here. And she said, well, everything's filed electronically in federal court. Like, oh. <laughs> and I was like, ding, ding, ding. So we call my husband who was at home with like a rum and ginger or some drink I can never remember. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, could you sue the president of the United States for me? And he's like, <laughs> 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 and he goes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> miss a beat, right? He's like, yep, no problem, ding, 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 ding. And so, you know, he files the lawsuit and then gets called back like a couple hours later and gets asked to do a written thing. And we were in court in an 86 degree room with ACLU lawyers and Mince Levin lawyers. Like by this time, tons of people had come because they'd heard what was going on. We were there till 1.51 a.m. on a, that was the latest I have been up in years, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> and, you know, the judge issued the order and it was, it was really, when you talk about hope in the judiciary, this is the most beautiful American moment I have ever been anywhere close to because they opened the doors, the federal courthouse on a Saturday night, the judge interrupted her play and <laughs> everybody came to help. And I find that that, you know, on top of the plaintiffs being so happy that we were there to help, I, I felt like when the judiciary stepped in and, and put their foot down that it was so American and quintessential American, it was really fun. <laughs> Do you want to add in, Peter? Just, this is fascinating because that night, I'm sitting at the computer in our kitchen, which is in the kitchen so you can keep an eye on what all the kids are doing. 
and I'm there. Oh, I'm sitting, while all this is going on, I'm sitting there in my kitchen at the computer wondering, what the hell has taken them all so long? <laughs> 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 so it's nice to hear the, what was going on. Miguel, tell us about what you're seeing with technology companies and also what you're giving as, a, as advice to people as an immigrant who's coming to the U.S. Right, so I think uh, when, when the ban came into effect, I think that a lot of people were very scared. And at least in our company, uh, there's, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's many employees affected by the ban. So, uh, I mean, there's two elements. One is that uh, uh, I think a lot of the high-tech companies are fairly progressive right now. Uh, their CEOs are fairly progressive, so are their boards. Uh, so there's that human element that is present at the board level, and the other one is a matter of taking care of the employees. and. Uh, and at least our, our company at Microsoft, there's a very uh, strong sense that the company needs to be there for the employees in a number of ways. Uh, so when the ban came into effect, uh, uh, first off, what I hear is that HR got inundated with questions about what is going to happen. And closer to your mouth, if you get closer to your mouth. Yeah, sorry about that. So there is certainly um, a lot of people contacted HR, what do we do about this? Because this is the beginning, and we don't know where it ends. Uh, and I think that the stories were getting compounded with, with stories from people that were being detained, even if they were not from any of the banned countries. They were going through stricter control. So it wasn't just a matter of, of the order, but the, uh, the border patrol, CBP, I think it's called. Uh, a, lot of a lot of these agents really enjoy the rule and enjoy not being chained anymore by the, uh, by the rules of the previous administration. So I think... Uh, that some of those desires of being stronger at the border uh, were unleashed. So there were stories of, uh, of people struggling at the border. Uh, there's been this very long-standing uh, issue with unlocking your phones and whether you can give the passwords and is the password your, your you know, it's, are they violating your rights? Is the, uh, the thumb enough or not? So, so I know that there was a, a and series of meeting coming out of Silicon Valley of people that were trying to organize. And I think that in the end, it ended up with uh, most, about 100 tech companies uh, essentially filing uh, uh, an amicus brief in support of, uh, of opposing the ban. Um, so that's what's happening. And, um, and, and I, I, there's two things uh, that I like to reflect on. One is, uh, is during this whole this whole Trump administration has been, uh, has been uh, the mood has been one of despair. And there's two things that really brighten up the day. I think that events like the, the one when the, bus, uh, the bank came into effect and the, mm -hmm. the people's response was very strong. And, uh, and I've always remembered that even in the grimmest moments, people would ask Chomsky, so what do we do now, right? Chomsky does these lectures that are always very grim, right? It's like, oh, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all doomed. And <laughs> everybody, in every lecture, they always say, so what do we do now? And, and Chomsky always says, you organize. You organize and, and you fight back. And, uh, and we did. I feel that um, if you have someone like Susan in your you know, uh, pocket, or you have a company like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, these big games, um, you have someone to go to. But if there are people who are listening who don't have that, they don't have that access. And it is a time of despair. What advice um, do the two of you have for those people? Because as you say, the rules aren't clear and people don't know what's happening. So w in, our, in our quest for knowledge tonight, what knowledge do the two of you have um, for people who are not here as naturalized citizens um, and came here for the American dream. I mean, Miguel is a great example of it. You founded all these companies uh, and, and, uh, and are a great success story for this country. And Microsoft has been able to employ many people around your work. Um, how do we give that kind of hope to people and, and other tools we can be offering them? Well, I, 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 I'll defer the legal advice to Susan. Uh, but I think that one bit of relief that we have is just how incompetent and corrupt <laughs> they've proven to be so far. And, and I think that, 
uh, when, when this whole thing began, me and my best friend, we've always talked about what is our backup plan, right? What is the backup plan? And in the last week or so, it's like, well, we don't need a backup plan. These guys are just too, I mean, this whole scandal with Russia is blowing up left and right. Uh, everything they do is, is just very low quality. It's <laughs> what you see is what they have. <laughs> so I, I think my advice is lay low. I mean, lay low a little bit because they're not that good. <laughs> that is awesome. Peter, <laughs> I'm coming to you. <laughs> Let's talk about journalism because um, it's hard to uh, feel that journalists are telling us to lay low. Um, we're very hyped up, as my own family will tell me. You're addicted to Twitter. <laughs> you keep watching the news all the time. I said, I'm in media. That's what we do. Um, we are hyped up in, in, in media right now because the stories keep coming and we feel like we have to I mean, I don't even cover the political beat, and I'm all of a sudden, I need to cover the political beat and decode what's you know, happening out there. What do, what do you see um, from a journalism point of view on what the journalists and um, media can be doing right now to help? Well, I, I, <coughs> I have to get clear my throat here. Um, I think we have a pretty simple job. Um, doesn't mean it's easy, but it's pretty simple that we should try to report what's going on as best we can. Um, that night, while I was, at the time, I, I've recently switched jobs where I'm going back to writing and broadcasting more from editing, but I was still running the WGBH website, and literally, you know, we had our people out there, some assigned, some who just sort of showed up themselves knowing there was a story, and um, from my particular vantage point from that night, there was a lot of waiting around. <laughs> but for, for, the, for the profession, um, I think we in the press have a very clear-cut and well-defined role, which is to try to report what's going on. You know, um, but it's never ending. Every hour there's another story with 20,000 questions to ask. <sighs> I mean, the Russia story is a perfect example. You, well, could, you could put, you know, a thousand of us on it and just drill down that every day right now. As I was joking with you beforehand, I am <coughs> I've now reached the point in my career where I'm often the oldest person on the panel. I will say that I have never seen anything like this before. <laughs> um, and you know, I got into the business around the time of Watergate and, you know, been around a while. This is, um, we have a hard time keeping up. Um, I, I'm not saying we, WGB, I mean, there's just an awful lot going on. No, that's what all journalists are saying. I mean, they, they're all saying this and that and this and you're seeing you know, photos of drinking from a fire hydrant. It's, it, the, you know, weekends well, that, are gone because he tweets on a Saturday. Well, well, see, part of the perspective is we're lucky. And I'm saying the WGBH, WBUR. We're, Boston is lucky in that for our two outlets, we're part of a larger national network, um, you know, National Public Radio or B and PBS. So um, we get to tap into things that are going on elsewhere. For example, in, in here again is, is how the media is so radically different from when I you know, started out as a 21-year-old kid. You know, I'm sitting in my kitchen wondering, okay, when am I gonna get to go to sleep? This is going on. But at the same time, seeing via Twitter, Everything comes over Twitter before it moves officially. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if you subscribe, if you are a subscriber to the Associated Press, there's a specific AP account that we have that no one else can get in that APs alerts their clients via Twitter that real news is coming over the wire. <laughs> Th this. Okay, so wait, I'm gonna ask you that question then for, for, for everyone. How should the public digest media and seek out true journalism right now? And the answer can't just be B, U, R, and G, B, H, which would no, be No, no, I, I was using that as because that's my, that wasn't a plug. No, no, I'm, I'm plugging it. I mean, that would be great well, because it's okay. very good journalism. <laughs> but <laughs> but wait, how, how should people digest it right now? Because there are so many channels coming at them. 
I love that. I'm a disruptor. The editorial's a new kid in town. So I'm not against the disruption, but y there, there's so much of it coming. What would be your advice as a seasoned journalist on how people digest media right now? Oh, that's a deceptively simple question. <laughs> um, basically, I'd say pick a medium or two and stick with it. Um, that's a, th that this is advice for you know, Boston or New England. Um, if you read the Globe, you don't need the New York Times. If you read the New York Times, you don't necessarily need the Globe. Find a handful of people you trust on social media, as well as a handful of people who you don't agree with, but whom you trust. I spend more time on the, the Twitter accounts I tend to follow most carefully are, you know, my friends in the business, and we make the stupid, corny, and cynical jokes that journalists make, you know, making fun of each other. Um, but I follow a lot of the conservative press. I, I think, think it's the, important. The, the smarter side. And um, actually, my, is, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, I would follow John Podoritz, editor of commentary, who is probably the most articulate of the anti-Trump conservatives. Um, doesn't mean you'll agree with him, but um, he often has some very smart things to say. I find some of the most interesting things at the moment coming from anti-Trump conservatives. Just as insights, they're looking at things differently. Um, their expectations match yours about the Trump administration. Now, if you catch me you, you know, trying to be careful and clinical here, I am being clinical because um, as an NPR station, we have probably a, a stricter set of guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I wear two hats. One, I'm a commentator. Two, I'm an editor. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to, well, I'm trying well, to walk Well, our goal as journalists is to see all sides. That yeah, is our goal. And it's a, now, I, I was Did I, am I approaching answering your question? Yeah, I think you approached it. I, I liked the answer. That doesn't mean it's right. Um. No, no, I'm not saying. It. There's another question implicit here, and, and I'm not sure this is the place to get into it, but in considering media, everyone looks at the media institutions, the New York Times, the Washington Post. My, my own particular view is that we don't pay enough attention to media audiences because this is largely a question of audience as much, if not more so, than the institution. And here's where something has really changed radically over 40 years, where just as the United States has, just as income has polarized, education has polarized, so too have audiences polarized. Um, I, I remember I grew up as a working class kid, blue collar in Dorchester. You know, my dad every night after supper would read the newspaper, the Boston Globe, literally cover, you know, page to page, including the classified ads where he said there's a lot of information in there, <laughs> which there is. I, I can tell you my late parents were two of the best informed people, you know, I had ever run into. And they got that from reading the newspaper and, you know, sort of paying attention to broadcast news. Today, that isn't the case. Affluent people, or people with affluent aspirations, are far better informed than your average working class couple today. And, and this is a complicated issue where the that I think people don't pay enough attention to. The, audi agree. the audience for news has radically changed in that it, in it, it um, mirrors the stratification of our society. And I think there are really profound and profound political implications for that. I don't think that an audience in the 19, I don't think Donald Trump could have been elected president of the United States in the 1960s, 1970s, you know, 1980s, 1990s. <laughs> Donald Trump is a 21st century phenomenon. Well, I think it's clear, you said in your letter to Livia, uh, that, you know, he is the symptom of greater problems. And so, um, I kind of, you know, we, we look to journalists, we look to lawyers, we look to entrepreneurs, because they seem to be people that can give us some sort of 
you know, stable view of where things are going. An entrepreneur can understand disruption. A lawyer knows the law. A journalist deals with fact. But I feel like I, I need artists to help me right now. And I'd like to know um, what you think um, artists can be doing right now and how are they responding to this moment in time. Um, it's a good question. So what are artists doing right now? I, I, I mean, I think artists were knitting hats for a bit and, <laughs> and marching on Washington and going to the airport um, to stand in the crowd. But, but, um, but I think uh, certainly, I, I mean, if I can divert the question a little, or, or, or I don't know if I can respond to it, but, but to come back to what Peter was saying about the news, I, I think there's some, there's some it's, it's a broader cultural issue that that I, I think is, is 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 complicated, and I'm not sure that I can simply understand it. But but with there are many positive things about the 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 breakdown of of of, of certain hierarchies with an understanding of what elite meant. There are many positive things that go with that, but there are also some disadvantages. So that there was some sense of aspiring to be a citizen, I aspiring to be a good citizen involved. Certain responsibilities, and um, that that people uh, people wanted to embrace and take on, like being engaged in your community, like uh, knowing what was going on, um, in the same way that, of course, in the 19th century, uh, America, uh, small towns across America had amazing symphonies because people aspired to listen to beautiful music, um, and and that is no longer the case. You know, um, it's why libraries are so uh, so important because libraries. Uh, not just as as repositories of, of of books and texts, but also as places of community, are, are as you say the places where people learn and educate. There's a, I, I, w at one event at the at the public library downtown, I heard Rebecca Goldstein, uh, the writer and philosopher, speak about uh, coming from an Orthodox Jewish family where she had been told that girls uh, girls should not, she, her, her, an uncle had said to her, it's such a shame you have a, a boy's mind inside a girl's body. Um, and that, that she was not supposed to learn. And, and she's, she said, as she was speaking, she said, thank God for the library, that's where I went. And you know, that she, she said, I didn't know what a philosopher was and look, here I am one. Um, and, and, and I think, um, but I think that that, that, that sense of, uh, of, of broad access to knowledge and education in that way, with the sense that there's a that it means something and that it matters, and that I don't quite culturally, I don't know how we address it, but I think we we have moved into a time of uh, one of the part of that interminable letter that got cut, um, that I cut out was about uh, about I mean I think as a as a teacher I can say we can date a lot of change from the advent of the smartphone, um, w with young people you know in terms of the concentration spans and and uh, the type of things uh, young people are willing and able to read and, and, and engage with, um, and the sophistication of their articulation. I mean, I, I just think there are all sorts of things that are in jeopardy, um, which, which, uh, which, which then have devolve into, into people don't care about the truth, they care about that fruit game on the phone. And um, <laughs> seriously, you know, right. and and then and then they don't they don't understand the responsibilities of citizenship. You, know, um, I am talking a lot. I will be quiet. No, no. But the, but um, Timothy Snyder, the historian at Yale, who has published uh, uh, a couple of short books about the legacy of World War II and what it has to teach us today, um, just one in the fall and one just now that's out of a small book called Tyranny. It's a number of lessons about tyranny, which you can pick up at the checkout counter. But he, in an interview with the Süddeutsche Zeitung, said that uh, that he has gone around and talked to not just students, but but people around the country uh, in the United States today do not know who Stalin was or what he did, do not know uh, what the stakes were in World War II. They've heard of the Holocaust, but they don't actually know anything about National Socialism or its rise. Uh, so they can't, when, when, when you say to them, well, there are all these echoes with fascism and so on, it doesn't, it doesn't actually mean anything to a vast proportion of, of the population of this country. That's related to what you're saying about uh, people simply reading the paper. How we address that. I know, I feel like it's like the leaky roof that you let go for a long time, and now you've got to like rip the whole thing off. 
and because fix it fast. And fix it fast because there, it's, it's a, it's, we can't stop technology and there's amazing creative things happening with technology. Um, the, it makes things way more accessible to more. Um, and so the question is, how do we embrace this disruption, but try and weave back in the things of value that hold a society up? What, what, do, we, what do we pack back in there that holds a society up? And um, maybe you have that idea, because artists normally do. Well, I do have one small thing to say, which is um, nothing, in spite of tech, I mean, except for technology, nothing is new under the sun. Nothing human is new under the sun. And, and it really is there in Shakespeare, all of it, right? Every bad. So what is happening every, right now? Every bad behavior. Today. Like, what's going to happen tomorrow, and how do we digest it through art? Because Tom Ashbrook had an amazing um, hour on, on Derek Walcott's poetry this week. And I felt like someone just gave us a bomb, a B-A-L-M. Yes. You know, it was so soothing to just hear this be universal beauty and truth. And uh, I, I'm looking for artists right now to help us process. But, you know, let me, by the way, I, I think you're asking the right question. And I, I think you're much more optimistic than I am about the way things are going to turn out. Not always. No. Um, Just don't want everybody to leave with to their chin on the ground I hate tonight. to be Donald Downer <laughs> here, but Very important thing happened this week. Uh, a guy by the name of Robert Silvers, editor of the New York Review of Books, died. It's a tragedy. No. But he had, he was old. Oh, no. He but, but, but there's nobody to replace him. <laughs> no, and in, in what was telling is that he died at the time of day when there was plenty of time for this to make the front page of the paper. Instead, there was a little tease on the front page Here's one of the most important intellectual figures in, in, you know, loosely speaking, my business. He's at the upper end of the business. On a page of the paper, in the runover story from the front of the sports page was about Tom Brady's missing um, uh, uh, jersey. Now, believe me, I'm, I'm not a big football fan, but I am a Patriots fan and no disrespect to Tom Brady, but there was a time that 20 years ago that would have been a front page story in the New York Times. I, I won't go into why it's so important. You could just simply say that, you know, here's a, uh, a, an intellectual publication that spawned imitators all around the world some just as good as it is, like the London Review of Books, or uh, online the LA Review of Books, or the Dublin Review of Books, or the Boston Review. I'm just saying, if for no other reason than that. But to me, you know, that happened this week, and it suggests a shift in values by the editors of, you know, the, the whatever President Trump calls it, the failing New York Times. <laughs> It, 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 it's a reasonable decision, but it shows what a vast change has taken place in our culture. Um, th there was a time, again, I'll think of my parents. My parents might not have known who Robert Silvers was, but they would want to know that this important person died. Um, Jimmy Breslin, who I, when I worked at the New York Daily News, his office was next door to my desk, and you know, Breslin deserved his front page obituary in the New York Times. But even, even the, the, the um, I was gonna say so-called, but unfortunately, President Trump has devalued <laughs> the, the, the use of that word. You know, Breslin was a popular figure. He deserved his spot, and Robert Silvers wasn't, but he was an important figure. And um, it, it's, there's a triumph of mass over class that is catching up with us. Um, you know, our society today is about spectacle, and it's about the commodification of our experience. And politics has become just another thing to be consumed by the public. 
and that's the way, and I don't know how we undo that. May I, may I just interject a small, just to, to put it on a, on a, on a continuum, um, I always love the fact that in 1947, when Camus first came to the United States, and none of his work had yet been translated into English, and his arrival was on the front page of the New York Times with a photo. So, Camus, uh, author of The Stranger and so on. But, but because the New York Times felt people needed to know. I mean, it's a failing of our education system. It really well, is. it's a shift. I, by, by the way, yes, I mean, I'm old-fashioned enough and, you know, nothing's any good anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's a shift. There has been a shift in our values. Well, I feel like I want to go to Miguel right now because the people in technology are seeing something different in that they're, yeah. I would think that w the crazy stuff being created in technology is where the hope is, whether the driverless car takes off or not, or whether we have this shuttle between, what's it called, between LA and San Francisco. You know, um, the, the, you're seeing in technology a revolution that if we don't understand how to code, or we don't understand how to use technology the way you and your teams do, we're behind. What are you seeing? And, and where do you see technology helping us with this huge transition that's happening? Um, well, there's a, there was just a, uh, my wife, Laura, just uh, shared with me a video this morning of, uh, uh, my, uh, my wife just shared this morning with me a video uh, that USA Today was running where they were showing women that were previously doing some other job and they said, you know what, I don't wanna be cutting hair w up to the point that I'm 70 years old. I, wanna, I don't wanna be standing all day, I wanna sit down. And, uh, and this woman uh, learned to write code. Um, and then there's another story of uh, somebody that my wife worked with many years ago and she also decided to pick up coding and now runs some New York Times uh, backend for their website. So it's, it's an interesting video of, uh, of women that decided to change their careers and they said, so what changed in your life? And said, well, first of all, now I can travel. Now, now I, have, uh, I can afford a lot of things that I couldn't do before. So there's, there's certainly th that empowering element uh, that I encourage everybody to, to pick up. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the interviewees is, is a mother of four and, and the boys are fairly old, so it's not something you, that you can't pick up, right? And so I think that that is very empowering. But, um, but on this subject of the news, I think that uh, we didn't see just how fast fake news really spread. And, and, and it's a shame that now it's, the term has been taken over uh, to blast the opposition, but what, what really happened is that manufactured news of events that didn't happen were circulated on the networks. And you know, I stopped talking to some of my friends over things that were blatantly false, right? Like, did you, did you bother to double check this? It doesn't take too long, right? But, uh, but I think that, uh, that high tech made it very easy to redistribute all this junk and we didn't act fast enough. Uh, and I think that some uh, high tech companies were responsible and they were actively selling and promoting and, and, uh, and advertising tools to the political parties to more easily target with lies uh, voters. And, and, I think that, uh, and, and I think that Facebook acted too, uh, too late. I think that Twitter hasn't acted as fast as they should have or haven't done enough uh, I mean, on one, of the pro one of the problems, Peter, when, when you say, oh, well, who was the editor that made the choice of putting the uh, Jersey, you know, um, Tom Brady Jersey story on the top, th there, there aren't really paid careers in journalism that are coming out of all the corners these days because Google and Facebook take all of the revenue now that used to make a newspaper that made that a career job for people. And so, again, uh, maybe, anybody jump in on this, but I, I, I look to, to Miguel and Peter, but Susan jump in, where, where is the role of Facebook and Google, not just on fake news, but on this pillar of society, which oh. is. Uh, I'll try, I'm okay. gonna set you up. Okay, because I have, I wanna be the antidote to the anti-technology voice well, no, here, because uh, I it, saw some amazing things happening because oh, oh, of no, technology. Oh no, because of, I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about a cultural shift. Yeah. No, See, I know, the, the, the question in, in my mind, the question about Google and Facebook, Twitter isn't 
hopefully someday Twitter, is not a question about journalism, it's a question about public policy in antitrust law. I mean, why a company like Google or like Facebook uh, or like Amazon has been allowed to get to be as large as it is, active in so many diverse fields, is a failure of, you know, legal thinking. Not you. <laughs> but it, it, to me, there's a public policy issue um, it, that is ultimately an antitrust issue. Yes, it has implications for journalism, but it's, it, it's not being addressed in, in the right form. That's what I meant about setting you up right. for. Well, that's one law I do not practice, and I will not practice. But I, I, I always wonder that, especially when, of course, like, how is this all getting shared so easily without any sort of ramifications for it? But, so I, I have a little bit of a different opinion. So what I saw, you know, with the Million Women's March and what I saw at the airport uh, was so much a product of technology, of, of Facebook, you know, they put out a call for people to come to the airport. I think it was like maybe 5.30, and I don't even know where they put it out. The airport was packed to the brim at 7 p.m. with over 1,000 people. That's amazing. And that does not happen without technology. And the Millions Women's March. And then there was lawyers who set up this website called Open Lawyer, Open uh, Airports.com, which so we could all, all the lawyers could talk about what's going on at each airport. And once you ask what's the antidote to the cultural shift, that's where your antidote is, right? Because people get involved in movements and they may be just a little bit interested in the issue and they get involved with people who are hyper interested in it and information gets shared and uh, they tag each other on Facebook and more and more information is shared that way. Maybe people aren't sitting down reading the paper cover to cover anymore and I sure wish they were and we might have a much better education system, but a movement can educate people like nothing else can. Right. And technology is a major driving force into that. I could not believe what technology did for us at the airport that night. It was, it was incredible. May and, and continue. May I just uh, um, interject there that I, that I think, you know, in looking for something that's hopeful in this time, I, I do think um, Chomsky has a point, <laughs> right, in his doom and gloom. But it has been, I, I, when I, again, speaking to students, uh, who, who have grown up largely apolitical and suddenly feel compelled and mobilized, uh, compelled to, to act and, and to, to engage. Um, the number of, of women, I think, uh, across the country who've stepped forward to run for political office, um, they're, they're just, they're, they're, you know, the, the silver lining of this cloud is, is, is to have, uh, to have uh, sort of awakened, uh, awakened, yeah, hundreds of thousands, mm. millions of people. We're talking, I, I just had a meeting with all the bar associations, we're talking about a public defender program for uh, representing immigrants, because you may not know this, but more than half of immigrants who appear in immigration court for deportation in shackles are, don't even have access to a lawyer if they can't afford a lawyer. And so people are like, what? You know, because of the movement. They're talking, what do you mean they're not entitled to a lawyer? I thought everybody's entitled to a free lawyer. No, not if you're an immigrant, because it's a civil proceeding. So. Uh, there's funding starting to fund uh, a public defender program. There, I can't tell you how many patent lawyers have asked me, how can I help? And it's like, okay, we'll talk. But you know what I mean? Like just people, people are coming out from everywhere going, how can I help, how can I help? And I, it's, it's amazing. And, and that is where those people will be informed. Did you know this about immigrants? Did you know that 60% of immigrants in this country um, have been here for more than 10 years? You know, things like that get spread to more and more peripheries. M maybe the core people, like people like us, were intensely knowledgeable about it, but the more people get involved, the more the information spreads. We're gonna go to questions in two minutes. If you guys can try really hard, I'd love to ask one question and give me a, a bit of a quick answer to it. Just play this game with me for a second. Knowledge takes away fear. So if people are fearful, and then Trump sort of feeds on that and gets them all riled up, this is your chance to give me an answer on some fear that you're able to help people bring down. So take a minute. And I want you to think of a piece of knowledge you could get out there from your industry or your vantage point to tell people not to be afraid, something that people are fearful of that they shouldn't be afraid of. So I, um, there's a lot of statuses of immigrants out there, and I get many, many phone calls from people 
who are lawful permanent residents, who have temporary protected status, who have all these levels of status that have been granted by Congress. And they're terrified too. There's only so much that this president can do with these wacky executive orders. There's a limited amount of damage that he can do. He's done, okay, I probably shouldn't say this. He's done a, a lot of it already. He's targeted and hurt the most vulnerable among the immigrant community already. And m the rest, there is some protection in the fact that Congress isn't totally off the railroad tracks quite yet. And there is a check there. And there's also the check of the judiciary. So we are geared up to sue. I, I'm actually starting a project just to make sure that we can sue whenever we can at any avenue that we can. There are lawyers who are just, everyone wants to help and we're putting them all to work to help to fight back against this. And, and that's where fear can be. Three cheers for the judicial branch of the United States of America. <laughs> a fear that you can dispel? Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm gonna speak to general dread and anxiety. I, I was having a problem right, at the, at the, uh, right after the inauguration of, of waking up in the middle of the night as if somebody had a fist around my heart. Um, that has somewhat subsided in part perhaps because of the spectacular incompetence that, um, <laughs> but, but, but still I feel I live simply in needing to keep up with the news in some state of dread and anxiety. Um, I, I would say that, that um, as you said about Walcott's poetry uh, being a bomb, I think art in any, in, in many, any of its many forms is actually, um, is, a, is a bomb. It, it is it is a reminder that you are not alone that that other experiences uh, echo your own that you're you're part of a human community it's also uh, it's beauty it's 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 order in a disorderly world yes. it's 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 light and hope I mean you can listen to glorious music you can get up and dance with a, a group you can read a poem with your child we're trying to read our kids a poem a day at least um, you know th you, there's so much that you can do that that will actually uh, for me, at least, in these past months, um, art has been a salvation. Mm -hmm. And sharpen your wit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Uh, the, uh, well, the first thing, um, and it draws a little bit on what we discussed earlier today, is the reality is that we are more. And uh, we won the election, we have a majority, and if it wasn't for all kinds of ugly tricks, uh, we could be worried about something else, about who's winning uh, some competition. So we are more, that is the good thing. I think that technology is helping us organize. I can't speak for the whole country, but uh, there are, uh, people are using technology to identify which districts we can swing, where we can donate, how we can donate, uh, how most effectively to do this. Uh, so I think it's called Swing Left. Uh, one of those. Uh, people locally here are working on uh, uh, a, a friend of mine from the office, a very good friend of mine is organizing Indivisible Somerville, and they're doing great work on getting everybody together. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and identifying causes that matter. So uh, one thing that, going back to we won the election, the reality is that there's more decent people than not. And it's just a technicality that they're empowered, but we're gonna get them out. Uh, there's a lot to undo. There's a lot to undo on the news, a lot to undo in the media, a lot to undo on fake news, a lot to undo on this legislation, but we'll get it out. And uh, if anything, it's, it's great because uh, as we talk in the office with minorities, uh, we tell them, we got your back. Maybe that's what we all need to say to each other, <laughs> we've got your back. <coughs> Let me give you two answers. The first one will be is, is, is wearing my hat as an analyst. Um, let me give two answers. One, first as an analyst. Um, in the don't let my business get you too worked up, first of all. <laughs> uh, th that, that's, that's important. Um, don't underestimate, as I think many in the media do, the uh, essential strength of, you know, the, the, the American safety net. During the, the Great Recession, there was all sorts of fears that everything was gonna go kaplunk. We came awfully close, but it didn't. I, I, I think now, as you've testified with the courts and some industries, we've seen that the, 
there is a resilience to our society that I think pleasantly surprises some of us. Um, I am pessimistic in the long run. I'm not as pessimistic in the short run. Now, as a citizen, <laughs> as a citizen, my advice is pay attention to what matters. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't pay attention to national or international affairs, but get involved in things at a local level. I think that part of our national malaise, to use Jimmy Carter's uh, unfortunate phrase from those days, is that, you know, we're atomized, we're separated from each other. And I really do think that people getting involved at a local level, whether it's helping out at the church soup kitchen or running for zoning board, I think all those are really important things and those are things that if any of us in this room is so inclined, we could do. And so as a citizen, I'd say the fellow citizens, do something that makes you feel good and makes you feel better in, in, a, in a very local way. And that might be going to the airport when asked to. And I'd like to say, read Ron Sullivan's interview because um, he informed me a great deal about incarceration in this country and ways that we can change things both um, when people, um, how they get bail, um, how they compromise for bail, um, and how, where our bias sits, and to remember um, that we need to think as we. In all of these topics, we need to think as we, not I, not where I'm from, not my tribe, not my socioeconomics, not my color, but we. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I hope that um, some of you have questions for us, because I don't know if we made much of a dent tonight, but hopefully we got a start. So we'll open it up to some questions. anyone has a question, I can bring them the microphone. All right, up there. I'd like to first um, acknowledge two observations that I've made so far this evening. First is that this is a room um, with a lot of whiteness and educational power. And second, that there seems to be a creation of a we versus them in some of the conversation. And I'm wondering where we as white empowered folks, for the most part in this room, can acknowledge our role in creating and sustaining systems of oppression, um, whether it's in your professions on the panel, and how we can take responsibility for what has come to a head here and that has been brewing for decades. None of you want to take it off. Well, you, you want me to see if agreeing with that. Uh, you know, we just had our, uh, our, you know, workshop in the company, and we were talking about uh, about uh, what holds back black people, and and we said, well, we're still dealing with the side effects of slavery, and we haven't gotten over that. Um, you know, some people still find that surprising, and uh, we ask them why, and then when they walk through it, it's like, oh yeah, you're right, I'm wrong. Right, so uh, you won't see me arguing against that. I think that, uh, that it's an education issue and we need to continue uh, telling the story. I know that we go through mandatory training to understand this at the company. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, I think they're great documentaries that people should watch. I can remember the number of this one. Thir well, 13, the that's why I encourage everybody in this room to read um, Ron Sullivan's interview. Um, I sought him out purposely to try and, and understand myself more about this. Um, you know, it'll sound cliche to say we read J.D. Vance and I've got Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad halfway through on my table. I, I understand those are cliches, um, but I think they're a step. And um, Ron really helped me understand in his interview how uh, biased the system is how too many black and brown men in our country are in jail, um, why that needs to change, um, how it can change. He gives tactical suggestions. Um, and I think just admitting that there's a bias. And, and I thank you for that question. I also think that w you know we all just have to keep trying. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, 
And as a Canadian who came into the U.S., the slavery is a big thing. It's, it's, it's not something I grew up around, and I've, I've been able to learn more about with my own kids in the um, U.S. education system, but it's a big issue in this country. I, I just, I just want to mention, um, a, in some ways unhelpfully, but for, the few, for a few months from now, a former student of mine um, whose name is Michelle Kuo has written an amazing book that will come out, um, I think, in the summertime called Reading with Patrick. Um, and Michelle uh, did her undergraduate uh, at Harvard. She's uh, the, the daughter of, of immigrants um, and uh, from, from Taiwan, I believe. And, um, and she did her undergraduate, and then she went and did Teach for America and spent two years teaching in, uh, in a middle school in Helena, Mississippi. Um, and she was a wonderful teacher, and somebody made a little film about, you know, uh, what a wonderful teacher she was. And then she came back to go to law school, um, in part because her parents uh, expected that of her. And that's one of the things that she writes about, is this, the tension between um, her idealism and the expectations of her family, and so on. Um, and while she was in law school, she was my student at that point um, in a creative writing class, uh, uh, she found out that a student of hers who had been in middle school had, had been involved in a knife fight and had uh, killed uh, had killed someone and was in jail. And, um, and she wrote a piece about it for the New York Times uh, and then went and went to show him. She felt it was important to show him the piece. And when she got down to Helena, Mississippi and went to the jail, Patrick strangely didn't care that she'd written a piece. It didn't mean anything to him. Um, and she she had a, a, a sort of epiphany, and she, uh, s she put on hold her, uh, her legal job with an NGO on the West Coast, and she went to back to Helena, and she spent a year tutoring Patrick in, in prison. And that's, um, the book is, is called Reading with Patrick, and it's about, uh, about the books they read together, starting, uh, starting with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, and, and ending with Walt Whitman. And, uh, and, the, and, and she includes in that book, uh, he, because he, when he went to prison, he had a three-month-old daughter. And, uh, and she, one of the things that she asked him to do was write letters to his daughter. And she includes letters that he wrote at the beginning of the year and letters that the, he wrote at the end of the year. And if my Harvard students, undergraduate and graduate, could write letters as powerful as the letter that he writes at the end of that year, um, I would be awed, inspired, and amazed. And, and I think um, what this book does, to read this book, is, is, to, is to, I mean, it's possible that he's the one brilliant writer in all of Mississippi. But, but actually, no, he's just a young man given the time, the attention, the conversation, uh, and the motivation, and hope, and hope that it means something. And, and what, it, what, that, what that does is that, I mean, I think that, if we think about what we can do and how we can conf confront um, precisely this, this bubble-like uh, separation that we live in, there are many ways we can, we can step out of the bubble and volunteer and, and work for change. And, um, and, and, and I know I'm, I'm sort of beating the drum for, for art and literature, but, but, but what those books meant to Patrick, but also to Michelle, the conversations that they had, the, the fact that his points of entry were so different, that when they read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe together, I forget the names of them, but he, he identified with the traitor. Do you remember there's the little boy who's the brother who's the traitor? He identified with the traitor, and for him, that the that story was so important because of the boy's redemption at the end. And so, for her, who had always identified with the little girl who first goes through the wardrobe, she had expected that that was where he was. But that that conversation, just to have that conversation, um, was important for both of them. I, I, if I could complicate the point, uh, listen, it, it's. Um, the, the racial divide is impossible to um, underestimate, despite progress made 
here and there. Um, I think a bigger issue, one that, that, is, that compounds it, and we really don't have time to get into it in great depth, but is the whole issue of joblessness and disappearing jobs. This is one reason why I'm, I'm so very pessimistic about the future. Between, when, and I'm gonna relate it to race in a minute, between the day Bill Clinton left office and the morning that uh, Donald Trump was inaugurated, 10 million jobs disappeared from the American economy. Now, I'm not talking about, y y you know, hiring people, you know, for less money. Or this. I'm just saying there were, 10, there were 10 million less jobs for a whole variety of reasons. You just take that, if, 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 if disadvantaged groups are beginning uh, uh, starting off at the point where they're disadvantaged because of the color of their skin, the disappearance of jobs is hitting them even harder. Part of the Trump phenomenon is that um, uh, uh, economic dislocation has become integrated, if you will. I mean, it's, it's a reverse case. And, and um, this dis the disappearance of livable wages for people is I think going to compound issues like racial tensions and stuff. So that's not a pretty picture, but it's there. So, I, you, you know how I, my husband is uh, Ethiopian and my children are a child of an immigrant of mixed race. And I grew up in suburban Medfield with you know conservative Republican parents. I'm adopted, so I think there's some gene gene genealogy <laughs> mixed in there. That's all I have to say. And, and, and you have those roots with Canada. Yeah, Don't and forget we have that. relatives from Canada. Oh, those are the liberal side, though, of course, right? Um, and I had no clue. You know, I grew up going to our local library, reading about Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela, and I was enthralled. And I thought I was a progressive, and I thought I understood racism, right? And my husband, I don't think he feels that he is a constant victim of racism, but there's certainly been really, you know, central things that have happened. You know, I walk into the bathroom. Can I use the bathroom? Sure, it's right over there. He walks into the bathroom. No. You know, you, you, that's happened. But by and large, I think he feels relatively safe. But I thought I understood something about racism, and I thought I was knowledgeable, and I thought I got it, and I didn't have a clue until... I married him and I lived, when I saw the world through my children's eyes and I saw the world through what might happen to them, through the fear I constantly have of that terrible first moment when they truly understand racism. And we put them in this fancy school to protect them from that, but there's gonna be a day, you know, where that comes crashing down on their heads and it devastates me to think about it. I've spent a lot of time worrying about it. So, you know how everybody says like, I'm not a racist, I have a black friend? Well, <laughs> you know. But there's some truth to that, unless you live close and you're enveloped in it and you really are deeply entrenched in a community of people who live and breathe this every day, it's very difficult to understand it, to, to have a complete grasp on what it means. And if you don't completely grasp what it means, you can't do anything to fix it. So maybe I'm not saying go marry someone of a mixed race, but you know, like, we need to unsegregate. We need to m branch out and it's, you know, it's difficult because it's not just coming from one race versus another. It goes both ways. People are more comfortable with people that they know. And it's a kind of a trite solution, but I, I think that's the only way I even begun to understand. And we still don't really get it. You know, the other day we were skiing and I was like, just cut everybody in line. He's like, I am an African American man in Utah. I am not cutting the line. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I never even thought of that, you know? Like <laughs> so Thank you all. Do we have another question out there? Hi, uh, thank you everyone. Um, so one question I had, I think one of the things that, uh, one of the big problems that we've seen in this past election is that uh, we essentially had two bubbles, the liberal and the conservative one, and uh, each bubble consumed a version of the truth that they already adhered to. Uh, what can we do in tech, art, law, and journalism um, to bridge that gap and make sure that we're not uh, preaching to the choir, but actually create um, a productive dialogue across those two groups. I, 
I think the only, it's an excellent question. I, boy, this sounds so corny. I, I, I think that as individuals, all we can do is just try to do the best we can to be straightforward. Um, um, it, that I think that's all I can say. And, 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 and by that, I mean also be as straightforward, be as true, true to the ideals we preach in a way that's commensurate with the power you have at your disposal. Um, and I think that as people get older and more powerful, that becomes more difficult. But I really do think that um, a lot of the mess we're in is because people have stopped taking responsibility for their own actions, as old-fashioned as that may sound. But, but I would like to say, I think, I think that this is a powerful, uh, <coughs> It's a powerful idea going around, and I don't think that it's a good idea. Uh, this idea that there were two bubbles and they were equally bad. And I don't agree with that. I mean, maybe because I'm on my own, but I'm also right. <coughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's a really, it's, it's a very powerful idea, and we kind of accepted it, sort of saying, well, there was, we had their bubble, they had their bubble. I don't think that is the case. I think that there are certainly policies and we might disagree on policies and we might live in a world where I think that raising taxes is good or raising taxes is bad. Uh, there's certainly that difference of opinion, but what we saw in this election was downright falsehoods and a, uh, and a, uh, uh, a productization of falseness to advance, uh, to advance was really at the end very rotten policies. It was at the end is for some people to make some money. I mean. We're, we disguised it as Affordable Health Care Act, or you know, the new. We disguised it in many ways, but in the end, they're really rotten core policies for people to make more money, and they just had to sell it to us. So they had to, you know, put that coating of gold on top of the turd. And uh, so I don't think that we should ever refer to this as, as we lived in two bubbles. There's only well, <laughs> uh, let me. Just, uh, a, a slight digression. There are two bubbles. There may be more. However, the conservative right-wing bubble, and th there's a, 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 a very important and very cl cleanly written study that you can find it online at the Columbia Journalism Review, um, that crunches the numbers in a very you know, straightforward way that has surprised a lot of people because it shows the extent to which if you will, the right-wing conservative bubble is so much bigger and more potent than people had ever realized. Um, it, it, rather than try to summarize it, it's easy to find online and, 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 and take a look. And we'll have to respectfully disagree about the, uh, the, the other bubble. Mar Martha Nussbaum, who's a wonderful philosopher, and if you follow brain pickings, Maria Popova, another oh. uh, product of technology and internet. Um, she put out a, a lovely compilation of Martha Nussbaum's work recently, and in it, there's a passage that Martha Nussbaum says, um, we often think of sort of aggressive and um, ill-motivated groups as being very emotional and, and t giving us their, you know, their pitch at a very emotional level. But, and I'm not doing this justice, so if you email me, I'll send you the passage. But she says that basically, you, this, for societies to continue the way that we believe in them in these democracies, we have to be passionate and emotional about what matters to us. And I, I think that we're at that point. So it, maybe it's not bubbles, but maybe we need to be a bit more passionate about our values and our moral conduct and, 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 and you know, be on these movements and protests about what matters, but we need to be emotional about it, and we need to m make sure people know it matters. There's a question in the back on the right with the red scarf.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to take one more question. I'd, I'd, I'd love to go on. Okay, I'll take two. I'm going to take one here and then this woman who's got the microphone in her hand. I'll, the one who has the microphone first. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, I want to just comment on your observation. We were talking about how art is a bomb. I think it's also a door. Because right now, if you want to go back to your first question, if you really want to understand something about what it might be like to be an African American in this country, you can go see Get Out, you can see Moonlight, you can see I Am Not Your Negro, and you can go to Huntington and see Top Dog Underdog, which will just tear your guts out. But the, the specificity and of the lived experience and the personal thing will, will tell you something, and they all bounce off of each other. I'm also, for some reason, totally at this moment obsessed with Hamilton. I can almost sing it myself. And I am now going to read for the first time in my life after living in this town for 40 years and not giving a shit about the Revolutionary War, I'm going to read the Federalist Papers. <laughs> brava, brava. I did, by the way, offer someone $100 who's in this room who I know can sing the Constitution. That would not be me. So um, <laughs> I am a public librarian at a nearby library, and um, I have just one comment and then a question after that. So the comment I will make is that your public library needs you. Um, there are many different ways to get uh, involved in supporting public libraries, um, specifically with friends groups. Um, almost every public library in Massachusetts has a friends group, and um, these are just volunteer organizations that help um, oftentimes generate money to pay for programs, um, in some cases like this one, and, and some other libraries that could be anything from like um, story time uh, performances to uh, musical guests to things like that, um, that aren't traditionally paid for in town and municipal, budget and municipal budgets. Um, so my question for everyone here today is, I, at my library, would like to do more around um, sort of information literacy and digital literacy and information evaluation for my patrons. Um, I'm used to this sort of being something that's tackled in academic libraries where uh, that, that's typically where those skills are kind of honed for students who are learning how to do research papers or learning how to evaluate sources to write um, for academic purposes. Um, do you have any good, like, innovative ideas for how public libraries who typically don't have much staff, maybe don't have many resources, could tackle some of these issues of in information evaluation, especially as we are just at hit bombarded, as you were saying before, with all this content that's coming through all the time? You know what? Put up a sign, because I think, as a library goer myself, put up a handwritten sign you know, in prominent places in the library and say, you know, we're looking for a volunteer to run a group about fill in the blank, because I'm not sure what you're going. And just the gut, you'll probably get a couple of people. It might be a start. Just a kooky idea. It's not that kooky. I think bringing people into the library like this, it doesn't really do, do the digital part, but it really does help bring, I, I can't remember what it was, but I actually had kind of given up on libraries, I'm sorry to say, but we were like, you know, our, my kids had Amazon.com and we are like going to the bookstores. I know, I'm in big trouble. And I'm gonna fix it, don't worry. And then like. Um, you are here right now. Yeah, I, know, I know, so, and then some. Yeah, I got, I got, no, but we, I fixed it. So then a couple summers ago, I realized that our library is like three quarters of a mile from our house. And so my daughter and I spent all summer going in and out of the library and she just really had started to love books at that time. And we just walked all around and, you know, I, you just gotta get them there. Once you get there and you see all the books, it's so incredible and so powerful. And so that's my only suggestion. Information evaluation. I, 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 I mean, it, it may be fairly related to Peter's comment, but, but, um, <clears throat> but crowdsourcing. I mean, if if you were to ask for input from patrons at the library about what sources are are uh, trustworthy or valuable and what are not, I think um, you know that it, it, it actually is something where you might fairly, fairly swiftly, um, you know, be able to establish some sort of of, of hierarchy, certainly a, a dialogue, you know, where, where um, people could respond about their experiences, so maybe on, online too.
I'm going to let everybody go home now. I know we could keep going, but I say go in good courage, uh, use technology well, try and follow the law, let's count on this judicial system, don't lie, read a few papers, try and read the other side and, and see art and uh, stay strong. <laughs> Thanks for coming. The very first diary entry of the captain of the ship that lands at Jamestown 1619. is the savages set upon us and attacked us, right? 